What's happening? Good, man. So I was typically late. I was yes, just how are you? trying to make this goddamn coffee. How you doing, man? Are you <laughs> getting yourself a coffee? Yeah, I think I don't know how long this is going to go. I've got my thermos full as well. I'm ready. Oh, shit. So, yeah, how you doing, man? Yeah, what have you been up to? Oh, you know, writing, podcast, the usual. Cool. Yeah. Keeping yourself to... busy. So, oh, yeah, man. You know how it is. The How's, life... the How's the quarantine life? Enjoying it? Oh, man, the quarantine life for me is blessed. I mean, you know, <laughs> minus the people dying. So you're making most of your time... Uh isolated by yourself and you know having more time for yourself i guess because oh, uh, definitely for i mean you know for us it's like we can then jump into you know the books yeah. the study makes you know the art more productive like i remember man when we met last year right i was texting you i was gonna be like yo i'm coming into central london <laughs> yep. and uh as you were as i was texting you you're like yo i'm on the tube and I'm at the tubes to see you go by. I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> How funny was that? And you're in like all like neon green or something? <laughs> yeah, yeah, the crazy rain jacket. I remember I got a text on my phone and I was like, damn, that's you right in there, right there. And then we, uh, what's it, met up in the middle of the, of the train, right? Crossing everybody. Yeah, nuts, man. But you were going to a workshop on how to draw Indian miniatures, right? That's right, yeah. So basically at the Prince Charles School of Traditional Arts, uh, which is based in um, uh, Hackney, they throw um, like short courses. So this was a summer short course. So they had teachers flying from Rajasthan. So um, uh, Indian miniature sort of uh, practitioners and you could say masters because they've come from a long lineage of court painters, etc. And um, so I was interested. I didn't even know that you could learn uh, this sort of art technique, Indian miniature um, per se. This was a Mughal miniature, which I was interested in for slightly other reasons. Um, so they have short courses available. And this was the first time I thought I'd try a course because I've also seen miniature paintings being done, etc. And um, when I traveled to Rajasthan, maybe I think 10 years ago, and I saw them um, painting uh, right outside one of the courts. And it really intrigued me. And I've always wanted to learn. And this was a great time to learn because Ajay Sharma is a great teacher. And also his wife who, who accompanies him. She's an also an amazing painter. And um, it was great. I got to meet some of my friends who are artists as well. One of my best friends, Chris, was there as well, which is quite funny. So, yeah. And uh, Jethro Buck is an, another nice artist. And um, it, was, it was a really good feeling to um, be learning from a teacher as per se, because um, usually I kind of, um, before I kind of made my own ideas up and own way. But once you... You know, once you have a teacher uh, in a certain way, you really learn that there is a is a pattern and there is a thing, there's a way of doing things. So for me, it was an eye opener to see how um, how paintings are made, actually. So, yeah, I, me too, right? Because I saw Chris there as well. Yeah, Remember yeah, yeah. That tea, that fancy tea was given out to people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fruit tea. But that was really cool that, yeah, we could kind of, I could sit down. And I was like a little fly on the wall there and watching all you guys learn how to paint. That was pretty cool. I mean, you yeah, know. No, yeah, it was good that you came along so you could see because I know you've been interested in uh, uh, Indian painting for a long time also. and Because um, it's a shout out. And it's like, you know, some people were messaging me about like modern paintings, you know, like the, yeah. the more seen ones of like Guru Nanak or the more recent whatever Sikh history right and everybody's seen right and it's just like to me it's like analogous to like the modern Sikh history that we hear you know like the modern history um that you see written in books which is like for kids you know like they take out 
most of the juicy stuff they take out uh, the reality of what was really happening, right? And then when you look back to see the old art, you're like, hey, something's different here. You know, why is it different? Why is the style different? Why are they showing that in a different way? You know, so it's like in both ways, like if I look at pre-colonial history and I look at pre-colonial art, I'm like, it's a different world from what we see nowadays, right? 100%. So going back to that um, uh, Indian Minish painting, I wanted to touch on, um, so what was around the first time you sort of came across Sikh painting and Sikh art in the terms of traditional style that, uh, that we both love? I, it was not until I was like a late teenager and I started Googling, like I would see, you know what was the first thing I ever saw was Baba, if you go to Amritsar, Baba Atal uh, <laughs> those press they have, painted uh, yeah. on the of the of the rooms right and oh, they're not toilet tiled <laughs> and you're like yo it's completely different um than what you see you know what i mean like the way what they're wearing is different even their even their mannerisms you know what i mean like you know you see the guru Nanak where he's like doing this and stuff expression is different yeah like so it showed a different world it was like yo this is not what i'm used to you know it's an eye opener so then you, then I was like, oh, I want to look into this more, man. And also, like, I mean, that's the beauty of it because that's where we kind of intersect is that art history. Like, they're using that art to tell a history, and that's what I, Indian narratives are so good at, or Indian miniatures are so good at. They convey like a really good narrative, in them, yeah. right? Agree. So, um, the funny thing is that you mentioned Baba Dal Tower in Amritsar, so. Um, I remember going on a family trip in 1997. Uh, this was the first time my dad, no, the second time my dad took all of us together. So my older brother and sister and a cousin joined us as well. And um, going to a Tal Tower was the first time I came face to face with this old style of painting, which is, so it was a fresco painting, which has come down from uh, Punjab style of painting also. And um, is exactly like what you were saying. I was like, why are they dressed so differently? Why is the turban style so different? And um, from then I became so interested, like, because um, a Sikh uh, culture or growing up, we grew up with a religious imagery such as, you know, every single house has got the Sobha Singh painting, which yeah, is yeah. beautiful. I'm not gonna uh, slash it, it's just such a beautiful painting. and. He's an amazing artist. Sobha Singh is an amazing artist as well in his own right. And, um, but that's what we grew up from. Uh, most households had those images and that's all we ever saw, even in those little v VHS tapes that we used to get with Sakis. And yeah. um, so see, see uh, the Gurdwaras and places of worship are filled with imagery. And this is what we grew up with. And um, in a way, uh, like the characters, the people, involved in the in the paintings um, were our heroes many like Baba Deep Singh uh, who's a saint was a, a hero to me just through the right. image and I felt that um, when I saw these old paintings in the Dal Tower uh, yeah. that really got me to question a few things like especially the style looking at the style of uh, the Sikhs and really opened my eyes to as why we don't look like that no more and then one thing led to another. Um, like later on, I discovered um, I had Warrior Saints. <laughs> yeah. The first book. And um, so the guys at Kashi House uh, collected quite a lot of old paintings. And I really loved the way they tied their turbans because, yep, part one of that, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, so... Um, wow. For me, that's what really got me interested is like, because my whole family and extended cousins and everyone tie a uh, traditional uh, type of turban, which is the African style, which is the triangle above the forehead. And yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> when, it, when I, it came into my teenage years, when I should start wearing a, a bug, like I could never tie that style. No matter what I did, it just didn't suit my head. And yeah. uh, I just started doing gold bug. And from there, it really... Um, I looked back at the old paintings and I always wanted to be them. Whoever was in that painting, I wanted to look like that. I wanted to be like that. And that's what got me interested in um, looking at Sikh painting. At that point, were you painting? 
Did you start, do you look at it and be like, all right, I'm going to start drawing this too? You know, I, we're talking probably when I was like 12 years old, 13 years old, and I would never ever paint from miniature painting at that time. Um, because at that age, I was drawing my favorite. Um, I was always drawing, always known for drawing. And um, I would always uh, draw my favorite characters, such as Bruce Lee, who's a hero to me, and Ultimate yeah. Warrior, or like characters from Street Fighter or Tekken. That was my thing. And, right. um, and that was uh, <laughs> somebody, because you were podcasting. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah. Um, Looking at my art style, it's uh, come a lot from looking up at heroes. So having these characters to look up to. Um, and it ties in with those characters such as Bruce Lee, such right. as it's this uh, male ego sort of um, sign of strength, which maybe, which I think I was looking for. Hmm. Right. I mean, I do see a lot in Hung's in, in your work and earlier on as well i remember yeah. um like my brother has this piece of yours where there was and i'll post this as an image after but on each side there's in the hands and they're doing uh dig and uh it's very like um almost um psychedelic in a way so like good. yeah yeah and, so okay um so that era, in particularly my style of painting, um, so I got into painting, painting when I started working for um, an artist named Connor Harrington, who was based in London. And he's a street artist, as per se. He was coming up at the same time as Banksy was coming up, etc. cetera. Uh, yeah. Same gallery representation. And I don't know if you remember this. It was kind of like a cool but street art magazine called Juxtapose. And no. basically, basically, it just picks up artists such as Banksy, James Jean, uh, Connor Harrington, etc., like that. And um, I really loved his painting, so I emailed each of those artists, even though they weren't based in UK. And it happened to be that Connor Harrington got back to me, and he said, "Yo, I have a space in my studio. Uh, your artwork seems great. Uh, yeah. Would you like to come work for me?" And for me, it was like a job, dream job, that came true because. At the same time, I was finishing my last year at university, uh, University Arts London. Right. And um, that was the first time, my first insight into painting massive, massive, like, uh, oil paintings and seeing how it's done, etc. And it was, it was an amazing eye opener. And um, so I started off looking at more photorealism sort of style of painting, types of painting. And because um, Connor's style is um, like a brash emotional style mixed with such precisional technique in terms of uh, photographic technique. And he mm. uses lighting um, based on um, Renaissance paintings such as Caravaggio or, um, you know, Michelangelo pre that era, looking at the chiaroscuro technique, basically of light. And he incorporates that in his paintings. And that was the first time I got into the world of art. Interesting. So then did that, did those styles then carry forward as well? Like, are you blending those? Yeah. So um, for a long time, I've been doing oil painting and it's only recently I've stopped because I travel a lot, etc. cetera. And um, it's just harder to work bigger paintings, but my style started going back into uh, Indian miniature because I was looking at Italian artists etc and yeah which isn't really me and which wasn't my first ever it wasn't it doesn't go back to my roots of inspiration what inspired me which was like we were both inspired by Adal Tower and those and there is something that we have as a tradition also like the Sikh has its own unique uh mm -hmm. painting style and subjects which derive from Mughal paintings or Rajasthani paintings but it has its own um, uh, its own subjects as well. Is that something you can can speak to, even if the audience is not like uh, sophisticated and in knowing the nuances? Like, what would be like a, what would be identifier to you if you saw like a sick one versus a Mughal one? 
So obviously, uh, Sikh paintings paint Sikh subjects because our poetry, which is um, so vast, so my interest of poetry got um, or Shabbat got more um, deeper as I started learning Sangeet, which is yeah. this is all happening at the same time as painting. Also, I was learning also Sangeet, and um, they go hand in hand because the poetry. You can see it in many Sikh manus early manuscripts, such as uh, Dasam Granth. You see um, paintings yeah. of Kali and Chandi, Avtar, etc. And this imagery is so important. I want to touch on that because even on yeah. Guru Har Gobind Sahib's uh, sword, you see an imprint of Kalima on his sword. And this imagery was important to them, and it's important to us of what it represents. And that is what, like the Sikh art is predominantly um, most uh, productive in Maharaja Ranjit Singh's time. Yeah. So after that, it just went boom. Yeah. And it's like, where did everybody go? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the, you raised two things there I wanted to talk about, definitely about, you know, how patronage then changed coming out of Ranjit Singh's time. And then you enter a period of colonialism where institutions, for good or for worse, they collapsed, right? And those institutions were giving patronage to, you know, artists. Yeah. People like yourself who would be painting, other people like poets who would be writing, you know, vast amounts of history. All of this history written here behind me on that shelf yeah. is during the Ranjit Singh's era, right? And yeah. like 90% of our history comes from that era, you know, because that was when we were able to sit down, when we had time to write our own history. Prior to that, we're just struggling to survive, basically, right? So, right. Um, as you as those patronage, you know, uh, institutions they fall apart, the old yeah. art they fall apart. So you look at like you're doing both, right? Art and music. Yeah. So music, we know, if it wasn't for you know people um, making great efforts like Baba Jijis and like Namtari and all yeah, of those people, tradition, yeah. If they didn't, you know, step up. You know, a lot of the music would have just uh, gone away, right? As well, the musical tradition. As well. It's not. Um, it's not one problem. It's like those problems that affect, you know, music, art, even the way history is told, changes over time because of that colonialism. Percent. So, um, just going back to what you were saying, because I, I was talking about the sangeet and art, sort of. Uh, yeah enlightened me at the same time in terms of I got inspired and I, that's all I thought about. Um, I remember when I was 18 years old, uh, just when I was uh, my first year in um, university, I went for a short break. I was learning uh, Dilruba of uh, um, the Namtari, Namtari yeah. and my teacher was Ustad Ranbir Singh. And, um, and, you know, there wasn't much known about Nihangs and Namtaris two groups of Sikhs. And to me, I've always been attracted by both because they sort of, the Nihang and Namtari tradition to me was sort of a bubble which has kind of been untouched for years. And um, like, it's almost like a, a pres preservation of time oh. in, in its own right. And as an 18 year old, this was an, on the days of dial up internet and there wasn't many websites on uh, Sikh tradition and every single forum I went to they'd always cuss Nam Thadis and cuss Nihangs and say these two are the worst groups they're absolutely rubbish you know the, you don't hang out with these guys there's always something negative about Nam Thadis and Nihangs uh, so as an 18 year old I thought I'm not gonna make zero opinion I'm just gonna go I went to India with uh, Ranbir Singh my Ustad and he took me to Siri Bani side and that's where, where I got to uh, Nam Tari Satguru Jagjit Singh Ji, which was an amazing experience for me. Uh, just the lifestyle, just exactly how I imagined the Gurus would have lived with the traditions of the Sikh music, etc. And in the same trip, I went to stay with uh, my friends, Nam Tari friends. We went to Dam Dama Sahib and we got to meet Baba Santa Singh of uh, Bodadal. And he gave us tapi. So he gave us blessings because we were learning Sangeet from Nam Tari Satguru Jigjit Singh's tradition. And it was such an eye-opening time because these two groups who are seen as uh, 
on the internet or by UK or Western Sikhs, they seem to be like, but when I was in India, the respect that they had for one another is totally unmatchable. Absolutely. It's wicked because uh, you said like, it's like going to a time capsule, right? It's like, I've been to Bandyside as well a couple of years back and, yeah. you know, beautiful. Like the, the amount of detail to attention that they have to creating their space. Yeah. It's like, and the traditions that they uphold, it's because, like, we talked about coming out of Ranjit Singh's era, you know, yeah. you enter that era of colonialism, who are the two groups that are fighting back against this colonial power? It's the Nahangs and the Namtari. You know, That's the Namtari is a great deal for the community, right? You know, and nowadays, you know, can say whatever they want with the Namtaris, but, you know, there's, uh, like, the evidence of them fighting back, you know, getting blown up by cannons, you know, like, old yeah, like um, you can't make sacrifice, man. They paid like in you know blood, right? Um yeah, yeah. and those two powers then, the Namtais and the Hungs, because they're so anti British, they yeah. they hate anything to do with the British. <laughs> like Hungs in the in the Dal, they refuse to drink tea, man. And uh <laughs> yeah. it's funny that's um when people talk about, uh, you know, identity formation and, uh, you know, what uh, people are supposed to do um, in terms of prohibition of intoxicants and stuff, they view tea as an intoxicant. They're like, no, we're not touching tea. <laughs> yeah, 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 100%. Because it's they're so... Like, ja, was this way with Babaji, this is ja, pina? Ja? Yeah. <laughs> you don't say it in the dog. Get your ass kicked, mate, for drinking tea. <laughs> for sure. And, but because of that... Because Yo, we hate everything to do with you. We're going to keep everything we do intact. Yeah. They're not affected as much by colonialism, right? So they are still heavy with the Muslim body, right? They're still yeah. heavy with traditions like coven and, and uh, things like that, right? So like, whatever you guys do, you guys do, but we're going to do what we do. And, you know, yeah. it's been documented in academia, you know, the changes that occurred in the Sikh community on account of colonialism, right? People... I've written about this for ages. People want to look it up. You know, there's plenty of books. But yeah. those two communities provide, like, and the, obviously the community down at Hazur side as well, in, yeah. uh, they provide, like, examples of, like, what happens if they said, basically, F you to everything, you know, colonial. It was like, we're just going to do us. You know what I mean? And that's what's so cool. And they have that mutual respect. Be like, oh, we, we get it. Like, you guys from back then, um, we respect you. Even like, um, I was reading Bant Prakash, not by Ratan Singh Pangu, but by uh, Gyan Singh. Gyan Singh, yeah. And he mentions how Nirmale, Nahans, and Namtaris, these are like the three uh, uh, institutions of the Bant. Like, he includes Namtaris yeah. as a of the Bant. Albeit, you know, they have a different like lineage in terms of Guru and stuff, but they're like, they're part of us. You know, they're a branch of us. Um, they were not always viewed like today, you know, and that's something. Um, that's why um, it's kind of rebellious. But I think our generation, like a uh, qu- couple of friends of ours, such as uh, Itvinder Singh, um, yeah, he's uh, on the Sarab, video. Sarab, uh, Biant, and so many, so many names I can say. But we all grew up around the same period, and I remember all of our parents were parents who tied normal turbans. But we never, we were always wanted to look like miniatures, so we learned how to tie traditional turbans. You know, they always come, it always comes up from the side. You know, yeah, yeah. The ears are out usually, and we we wanted to grab this identity back and take it back for ourselves. And because, sure. firstly, they just looked amazing, and um, it's a th- that, that's that's a beautiful thing about art and history and how they combine. Because in that art, it shows what people used to dress like, what they used to wear. Yeah. And in that, you see their demeanor, their mentality. Amun had a good question. Um, yeah. Yeah, does Gyan Singh mention uh, Udasis and Sevapantis? So this is what's interesting. Yeah. Gyan Singh talks about Khalsa, you know, as being Singhs, Amritari, you know. Um, and in that definition, he includes Namtaris, he includes Nahan. But... Yeah. Outside of that, he says, okay, fine, but we still have Sehej Thadi. We still have other groups that yeah. may be dear to the Khalsa, you know, identity. And there he includes Seva Pankhiz, Udasis, 
etc. These other groups he includes as well. But that distinction even proves more so the importance of Nam Tariq being recognized, you know, because they did maintain, you know, the form um, of the Khalsa as well, you know what I mean? So uh, that distinction by Gyan Singh is very interesting that he makes. But um, yeah, I mean, uh, Amino and Itzi and some of those guys as well, like we have mutual friends, Navi we were talking about from... Uh, Nabi, and then we all grew up in the same era of learning uh, Dilruba from Rambir Singh, etc. And it, then I could truly say it was the first time that there was this whole revival sort of feeling. So we're talking about uh, 2000, early 2000s. And it was because you never heard traditional Sangeet. You could never hear it in the Gudwara. I was lucky enough to grow up around uh, instruments such as the Dhamma, Jodi, because uh, my family is from mm-hmm. Nanak's lineage. And uh, every month we used to go to Purunmashi and, you know, just hearing the Tamma in the court being played, it's, it's something that's always stuck with me. And yeah. um, the first time I heard a Dilruba being played was uh, by Hajinder Singh Lali. In, uh, there used to be a boss Sikh camp in London. And there was um, an event in, uh, um, what was it, King's College. And... Um, My brother sort of dragged me along. He was like, oh, come to this Geetan event. I was ne- not even interested one bit. I was, yeah. at that time, I was listening to Eminem because everyone was listening to Eminem, listening to rap. And I was not interested in classical music. And I remember Thanks, just dude. arriving, <laughs> yeah, arriving at the place. And uh, I just heard, it was the first time uh, I heard Rag the Nasri being sung, uh, King's College, that's right. And um It was the first time my hair stood up, ever. <laughs> and I remember it was Rag Tanasri, and that instrument just killed me, the Dilruba. He, uh, the Shabbat that was being sung was Tum Karyavo Mere Meet, which means oh, yeah. home, my friend, right. you know. <laughs> yeah, in Rag Tanasri also. And um, I was just like, uh, just so hooked. I ran up to him afterwards, and I was like, I have to learn Dilruba. And um, uh, he's, so I had to buy one first, which my dad bought for me. And... Um, Like, there was no teacher to be found, except two, three roads away from my parents' house was uh, Ustad Kamaljeet Singh Namtari. And my dad was like, oh, yeah, he must know. He used to. And he was an amazing musician. And um, my brother and sister used to go and learn from him as children, just like on the Vajra, just a few uh, tunes. And um, I went to, I used to learn of him first before I knew of Ranbir. And uh, Ustad yeah. Amaljeet Singh is, you probably heard the Shabbat Oha Prem Piri by Baljeet Singh and Gurmeet Singh. Yeah, I'm going to yeah, say yeah. That, yeah, <laughs> so that's his um, his mother's composition. So he taught Baljeet that. <laughs> Sweet. So, so like, you've been learning that little Bible since then, right? From those guys. That's right, and, yeah. You know, obviously we're both interested in the traditional, like, obviously, and even in the urban, the style, style and stuff. How do you then, this? like I saw recently posted um, an image of a rag, right? And yeah. usually, like how people uh, paint these rags in like this rag mala fashion, they personify a rag, right? And I was explaining this idea on my podcast about mythology and how things are personified, like, you know, the air is personified, the wind is personified, just live there, right? to give it a poetic room to, to have fun with, right? To play with uh, in a way to, to, to throw it into a narrative, right? And now you put out this rag in a very different manner than the traditional. Like it's yeah. a traditional style in the sense that you're painting the rag, but it's yeah. not a to personify it. How do you then, like, is that a normal thing for you? I see with the music as well, like you're doing traditional, like I saw you posted as well yeah. recently, you're playing the rag, but then you have contemporary people, uh, yeah. like musicians, playing all sorts of different music. Like, you like to blend, right? I mean, this is the natural way it's going to occur, because we're not trapped in the past. We're not ghosts of the past. We are here in present now, and like uh, I grew up in London, for example, and London is a super mixed place of cultures. You have all different types of cultures, and religions, and philosophies, teachings, and uh, you know, ways of life. And it's a big melting pot of culture for me. And um, naturally, your art will always be contemporary. Like, 
even if you're learning from a traditional school of painting, um, you'll always have your own take of it. It's, it's like you have a foundation. Even if you create something, you, um, it will always be fresh as long as you don't steal any ideas or you're not retracing an existing drawing or something. Because um, I believe that uh, I am a part of a, a lineage and a movement of uh, Sikh art in, in this and carrying on a tradition. And there's a few other artists who are alongside me, such as uh, Rupi Kaur, um, uh, who is also a painter, and also uh, Simran Kaur from UK. She's also an amazing painter. And my friend Chris, uh, who's also learnt this art, and also Jethro Buck. These are a few names. But what I'm trying to say is that it will always develop. And um, there's an art style called Neo Mughal Miniature, which is a kind of a tradition uh, which exists in Lahore, Pakistan. Uh, amazing artists such as Imran Qureshi, uh, uh, am alongside Aisha Khalid, and uh, among others. And the Lahore School of Arts is probably one of the best school of uh, Mughal arts I've ever seen in terms of painting because they still teach, they have outside funding and the L Lahore Biennale uh, looks so amazing. And some of my favorite artists come from uh, Pakistan and who are current practitioners today, um, which is the, um, the Mughal, new Mughal miniature side. And I think we have something which is bubbling up, which is coming from the Sikh side again, which is yeah. painting Sikh subjects. Also uh, with the poetry, with there's so many unexplored things. I have like billions of ideas that I still have to paint. Um, as, as you know, Dasan Granth is untouched. Yeah. And so yeah, we, you mentioned, um, you know, those images in the manuscript, man. And I was trying to think back, it might be, I'm trying to decide if it's Baba Tal or this manuscript. And I grew up in Ottawa. And uh, in Ottawa, they had a, like a library there. There was somebody there, Ajit Singh Sohota, hmm. a collection of these manuscripts that he picked up in India. And uh, I think all of those manuscripts now are in Toronto, um, hmm. on the USO, I, I believe. I'm not sure on that. But anyways, he had this Dasam Grant, right? And it was from, it was from the 1800s because uh, of the writing style, it was handwritten, it had amazing illustrations in it. The first page, and this is what the, one of the first things that kind of shocked me, when it had above job side, the starting, right? It had a picture of David, like Chandi on it, right? It had people, thing. And like around it, it was gold. And I'm sitting there as a yeah. like 15 year old, and I was like, yo, um, like this is like for six, right? Like this yeah. is supposed to be. And uh, why is there like a Hindu baby on it? So totally not understanding the context of what's even written in Dasam Granth, right? Yeah. And then as you get older, as you start studying it, you understand why they would do that, right? Why they would, how it's quite natural for them to do that. Like and, I have a, whole, I have a, paint, a picture eh? like in uh, Davinda's book. So looking at Thor's book, he has the, you know, the famous image of Guru Gobind Singh. Yeah. Um, um, which is Wait. this one. And on top, you can see a, a Devi doing Jor Sahib over Guru Gobind Singh Ji. Yeah. And for me, this was such a mind-blowing picture because it was a uh, pre-colonial sort of image. And and we know the relationship that uh, Guru Gobind Singh has to Chandi with uh, Bachitra Natak in his yeah. past life as a uh, Dush Daman. Yeah. And uh, she... He always, uh, well, our tradition tells us, uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that she's always indebted to him in a form of protection, in a way, for protecting her in the past. So I see that yeah. Devi as her <laughs> being as his guardian, for example. There's, that, there's that, um, that relationship they have, right? Where it's like, you know, the masculine energy versus the feminine energy. And, um, you know, many times, like, look how many compositions. Like, if there was a couple of threads that go through in the entire um, writings of Guru Gobind Singh, it's definitely in praise of Chandi. Like, you know, you have three compositions right off the bat, Chandi Diva, Chandi Chirithar 1, Chandi Chirithar 2. But that's not it. It's not like he touches Chandi there and stops. You know what I mean? Like, in Chirithar Pakyan, he starts off the first Chirithar is dedicated to Chandi. And other passages like Krishna, Avtar, like, 
in a text that's dedicated to Krishna, yeah. he is talking about Devi in there. Like you have section that's in it talking, like saying Devi Ju Ki Ustad. Now Ju yeah. uh, is basically G. So where Guru Gobind grew up, he grew up in Patna, Bihar. In Patna, Bihar, they say Ju instead of G. Yeah. And another way that you can kind of, uh, you know, get an insight into Guru Gobind Singh's uh, poetry, his language that he used. But I mean, there's a there's a fantastic relationship there, right? And which authors then in the Gurbalas era, like in the 1700s, and then in the 1800s, they speak about they have these stories about Guru Gobind Singh doing a havan, like a fire ceremony, you know, summoning Chandi to like you know wreak havoc on on yeah. the Mughals and, and empower the Khalsa six, right? So yeah, you know, those type of mythological texts come the colonial period, people hate them, right? People even hate those uh, paintings that, that depict Chandi or any other type of mythological figure because they think, oh, you know, uh, it's not real, you know? But yeah. but again, it's, I talk about That's this on the... Uh, British colonial mentality also that kind of, uh, you know, got rid of these imagery and these ideas of uh, traditional Hindu figures within our own dharam and um, really tried to make... Uh, things seem Sikh. So Sikh was yeah. never in a box. We have never ever come across it personified in a box. Even in Guru Gobind Singh Ji's time, he accepted all types of groups of people and, um, you know, had had them for their best attributes also. Um, but even in the painting form, sorry, somebody asked an interesting question. I'm just going to ask that. Navi, he said, uh, Navji, have you ever shown a British art yeah, so, so miniature art to British peoples. Um, I mean, in uh, there's a few artists like I mentioned that come from Lahore. Lahore, so uh, in in a lot of art fairs that I go to, these established artists such as Imran Qureshi, who his early works come from miniature work. Um, they have been uh, shown in today's contemporary art world, and shared and funded. So. It, this art style is is thriving and is also uh, a part of the contemporary art world. Also, it's, it's not separate. It's it's That's nothing fresh. It's always right. been part of there. The only things that would be fresh are ideas and uh, new artists and new ways of communicating. So, for me, it's just a form of communication. It's like a language. I've learned a language. And I will try my best to communicate in this language because I believe that language is my mother tongue, for example. That's how I see the difference between um, Indian art as opposed to Western art. Right. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, you've been getting like an amazing reception as well, right? Like, I mean, every time I talk to you, you're working on pieces and stuff, so. That's uh, right, yeah. I mean, there's a market for it. For example, uh, a highlight of uh, one of my uh, points was going to Miami Art Basel and um, uh, exhibiting with a gallery there and who flew me out there. Uh, I happened to be there with Sikadelic and um, basically uh, they weren't sure to take me because my artwork was new, you know. I was up against the walls with artists such as Eric Brunetti who were represented by the gallery and um, Cheryl Dunn, photographer. Um, and uh, they weren't sure because I was an, a small fry at the moment. Uh, and my piece was of uh, a black and white piece. One, uh, there was two pieces, one of a Nihang Singh, uh, painted in black and white with no eyes. It was these two small pieces. And one of uh, Maharaja Dilip Singh uh, with a total black. And um, funny enough, they sold. It was the, f the only pieces that the gallery sold. And it Brilliant. wasn't about... It wasn't about the selling, it was the fact that there was a market for it. For There was, you know, they were unsure to um, take my work. They didn't know how it would respond. But it was right. such a, it was, it seemed like it was refreshing for the uh, scope art basil sort of thing because that painting of the Nihang Singh that I painted, the, uh, it was on the front page of Miami Herald uh, newspaper next day right. talking about Miami art basil highlights. So which was another uh, feather in the cap because the gallery were like, oh, damn. <laughs> That's so, uh, what I was getting back to is there is a response. There is a, a market for Sikh art also uh, within uh, Western and also Sikhs itself. So it's um, definitely people are interested also 
in uh, what this language has to say. I remember seeing photos from that event, man. You were you were with Fer uh, Pharrell there. I remember seeing yeah, you. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> the funny thing is that, um, you know, I met lots of celebrities there because we were hanging out at the same parties and exhibitions and stuff. And um, the funny thing is that when you're young, you're like, wow, this is amazing. This is the lifestyle. But for me, it's actually just about the art. So for me, the art is important, way more important than the lifestyle, because I'll tell you why, because um, galleries open and close. Do not yeah. focus on gallery. This is just going out to your artists. I wouldn't care so much about galleries if I was an artist because um, they always open and close. They're always losing funding, etc. And um, you need to be an artist. And an artist means, for me, is uh, somebody who's working at it all the time, every day. Um, yeah. It's a part of your life. It's your life and breath. It's that expression. I'm not going into expressionism as a term, but um, it's... Uh, the the actual the actual fruit is in every day. For me, I have to paint every day. For example, <laughs> Basically, that's why you love uh, the quarantine time, right? I mean, for me, that's why oh, I love man. it. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. So I get to paint, I get to do music, and so it's really good. Wicked. I was watching a documentary called The Steeple One, and they're talking about you know this guy who was working with Dre as well, right? And he was like, "Listen, you're creating." You're like a you're like a racehorse, you know. That's why they have blinders on. You know, racehorses have blinders on, so they're yeah. not looking at the horse next to them. You know, yeah. and they just if you look at the horse next to you, you look at the other horse. That's it. You're done, right? You can't like, worry. Uh, about yeah, yeah. It's like combat. You know, you look at you look away from your opponent. You're gonna get smacked. And you get KO'd. Finished. So you have to have a a focus, a goal, and. Um, I mean, there's some amazing collaborations out there, so uh, which I'm lucky to have had and also met through doing great exhibitions. Because at the end of the day, exhibition is about communicating. It's uh, showing and sharing yeah. your artwork. And the same with music. I, I feel they're the same thing. Like for me, when I do a concert or I'm yeah. uh, working with a, a, one of my favorite musicians and we do a concert, it's, it's the same thing. It's about sharing. It's about the people. It's yeah. not about how amazing your work is, how great it's. It's how do you communicate mm. something? So. No. I mean, that's like a major uh, reason why I got into the podcast as well. Like, I would send you clips, right? I sent you a clip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's an amazing job you did. About, remember that story I was telling you about Guru Gomez saying, and um, there's some sadhu who comes to him and... Oh, uh, yeah, 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 I remember this. I still have to paint this. He's bald, right? The sadhu <laughs> and sadhu and another sadhu, there's two of them. And they're like, yo, Guru uh, Gomez saying, can we please, you know, hold your uh, balki up, like this big chair thing, right? And they're going to walk with... They're going to hold this up. And yeah, Guru that palakin, sit, walking palakin thing. And as Guru Gomez Singh is sitting there on this palakin, he looks down at this bald sadhu head, right? And yeah. he's like, his head looks like a tabula. And he starts playing tabula this guy's head. <laughs> the Saudi then starts making the noise, like a, you know, a tabula player would do, like, ha, ha. <laughs> <laughs> and go like a couple of kilometers as Guru Gomez Singh is like playing tabula and bongos on this guy's head, right? <laughs> I should have got Ben to do that on somebody's head. <laughs> so wicked, right? And like these, I like hilarious, funny stories that are in these old texts, right? And yes. I, just, I sent that to you, I sent that to like psychedelics here, messaging. Yep. Which is so my, visual. Like no, visual the, representations. Huh? Like these visual representations which have been sort of undiscovered. Because for a lot of Sikhs, we like going back to heroes, our gurus are heroes for us. Yeah, um, yeah. And uh, uh, a lot of um, untapped uh, imagery has it, you know, there is so much to be explored basically within the Sikh imagery. And uh, a good question from someone was like, uh, when Sikh gurus iconoclasts or, you know, against image or idol worship, etc. Uh, yeah. Or like, I grew up believing that the gurus have never existed in image form, except actually when I saw actual paintings when I went to Pai Rupa Karpin in Somebody India. In the comments, but yeah, go on. Yeah, I went to Pai Rupa Kepin and he had a 
portrait of Guru Gobind Singh Ji, which was done in front of him. And he had yeah. a few others that were done in front of the Guru. Uh, he had one of Guru Har Gobind Sahib Ji. And yeah. um, it was so intriguing, just so intriguing. And like, um, it is said to be believed that these were painted and, and commissioned uh, by the Sikhs of the Gurus. Yo, and it's said to, right? But then yeah. as you do historical text, like I posted this on the Mangla Jarn page on Instagram, um, if y'all, like I found historical documentation that talks about, okay, you know, this is who, who um, commissioned the painting. This is where the painting was done. People um, say that the painting is still there. And people are talking about the 1700s and the 1800s, right? Yeah. So, you know, we know that at some point, people commissioned the paintings, whether those paintings are still there. I mean, if they're the legit ones, like Gashi House in the Warrior Saints has this one of Guru Hargobin, and it looks yep. very similar to it the was one. the same, exact same face as the one yep. in Pai Rupa Kapin, but they were sitting cross-legged. Yeah, exactly. So that makes so, you think. Like, looking at imagery and looking at characters, it's the exact same person. Yeah. You can find this in Warrior Saints, we'll talk about yeah, it's, isn't that wild? Like, it gives you an idea about maybe how they looked, how they dressed was completely different than what people portrayed. Hundred percent. And yes. it wasn't. It wasn't only the paintings that existed at that place. I also saw clothes, clothing of the gurus and utensils, which I use in my paintings now. So these are reference from real clothing and attire that existed, and which I've seen and documented, and and. The style, you know, really shocked me. Yeah, that details. Like, if you look at the also interest, having an interest in the fashion side of things as well, because fashion, uh, to me, has to do with uh, expression and also um, how you portray yourself. It's creating an image of yourself. Also, you don't just wake up out of bed. We don't just wake up with our hair open and that's it. We, you know, that's us. We we have a cus uh, a ceremony of getting ready and dressed up and portraying mm. yourself. So in a way, we everybody is uh, is creating an image of themselves every day without knowing. And uh, looking back at uh, what the gurus may have looked at, it's uh, it creates such a fascinating image in my head. Yeah, fashion, bro. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Now that's really important, as well, like the detail that you talked about, not only in fashion. Like I see it in the way you draw the weapons as well right which is another thing like you look at modern art there's no because they obviously they don't know the differences between like a sirohi and a tega uh, like what types of uh, guitars like small daggers they yeah. have but yeah. i see that included in your painting like the one i posted recently um it was guru gomez Singh doing asadivan right uh did i posted it on twitter and uh like the detail in that is amazing now it also shows um, like those miniatures, right? They create a narrative, which I love, right? It's not just showing what they might, it's telling a story at the same time. Right? That's right. Because, you know, I think for me, the psychological side of it and the relationship to Guru Sahib is basically, because um, he said that with his children in his, uh, you know, when they said, what, what about your Tar Sahib Sahib? And he said, we're all his children in a way, that's a way we can all relate to each other is because we're sings, we all sings, and we yeah. all have the same father. And um, it's trying to get to know your own father. So it's having this, uh, this side of um, relationship, as you can call it, because this image, it's not just a, that's something that looks cool or that was, it comes with a great responsibility also and but, also character so but that, but that notion right like this notion is almost blasphemous nowadays like people nowadays if you have a photo of guru nanak and like oh let's say like you bow down to the photo or something people are like yo you're an idiot you know you're stupid for doing this. but that idea has only come into the community as yeah. a result of this like protestant christian mentality about what it means to be Nothing a devotee. Nothing wrong with that, though, mate. <laughs> you know, yeah, I mean, like, yeah. before, somebody posted a question, um, yeah. and I don't know how many questions we're going to get into, but somebody posted the question, like, you know, before, you know, printing presses 
I'm just going to have a look at some questions whilst you answer that. Yeah, go. Before printing presses, they didn't have a lot of sroops. They didn't have a lot of uh, manuscripts of Guru Granth Sahib. So That's what did true. they do? Right. So some of them had weapons, and you know the community would come in there and just bow to the weapon. And somebody asked me, "Is that not idol worship?" But like, first of all, this notion about what it is to have an idol, like what is an idol? Like one can question, is bowing down to Guru Granth Sahib an idol? You know what I mean? And it's all about intention, though, I think, right? Like, even yeah. somebody bowing down to that, the Guru Granth Sahib, they're not thinking that, you know, this is it. Like, obviously, the Guru Granth Sahib speaks about how Paramatma, how the divine is in everything, right? Yeah. But you're respecting the wisdom that's coming out of that, you know, the Granth, right? In the same way, when you bow down to a weapon, you're understanding that, you know, Shakti energy or consciousness is everywhere as well, right? Which but, is the female side of it, yeah, Shakti. Yeah, but you're paying respect to that in that context, right? So in the same way, like, if you have a painting, obviously, maybe these paintings are not exactly uh, Guru Nanak's image or Guru Hargobind, Guru Gobind saying, but you're bowing down to the idea that, you know, this is my Guru. And the same these way. Are, the same way yeah. as uh, Tanna, uh, you know, found God from a stone. Just yeah. a simple farmer found God from a stone. Exactly. Like It's, that's, it's not about yeah. the end product. It's not about A to Z. It's about the journey in between. That's what's important. And that's what's important with spirituality, with art, to me, to music. It's not about A to Z. Because it, just take music, for example. Like, I could learn an amazing rag, but on, you know, with the tans, pray Pamadapa really fast, whatever. But if you don't have the feeling or dedication or devotion inside you, it's almost empty. And I'm not interested in a finished, just perfection with no soul. It's, it's about the journey in between. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, some people will even, I mean, like, if you want to take that idea to the extreme, some people, those people are even against music, you know what I mean? Which, yeah. like, our community has utilized arts, music, um, to yeah, use right. vehicle to, like, uh, deliver, you know, a message, a feeling, an experience, right? Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's sad that, I guess, nowadays, a lot of the community doesn't put importance on it, which is why there's no patronage for these types of, you know, yeah. musicians, artists. Um, but, I, I mean, you know, we're still finding a way to make it work, like yourself are finding, you're finding a way to make it work. Yeah, yeah. Artist Rupi, I think, was on here earlier. I'm not sure if she's still on. Um, I mean, there's a lot of things, like, uh, what would you advise if somebody wanted to get into uh, learning, you know, do what you do in terms of historical references, and what would be a great starting point for someone who's, you know, had no interest, but after, for example, hearing this talk, they, like, would like to get into uh, learning a little about Sikh history, such as yourself? History, you have to, I mean, you can start off reading some English texts, like some texts have been translated, like Pant Prakash, yeah. if you want to look at, you know, the history uh, of the Sikhs between the, in the 1700s. But yeah. on it, um, there's a lot of work you got to do in terms of learning language, le learning languages. So um, because people have not given, um, in important to the historical text, a lot of the main ones have not been translated. So like this podcast that I'm doing, Swedish podcast, is taking like the most important historical book that we have for the gurus and putting it into English in summaries, right? Um, and so the community is lacking in terms of like providing English uh, literature that deals with history. And because the English literature that we do have that deals with history has come out of this notion of uh, from colonialism. So when they talk about history, you know, it's just embedded with these ideas about how like a Protestant Christian would view Sikh history. You know what I mean? Yeah. Even if the story is a thing, right? Yeah, even the translations sometimes are off of Shavuot, Gurbani, etc. Definitely. And language is something, you know, you can learn it, but it's not, it's just yeah. how dedicated are you, you know, to the process. And uh, it does require a lot of time to learn some of these languages, but, you know, if you're in, if you're into it, um, jump in. If not, you know, support others who are doing the jumping in. You know what I mean? So that's the thing is like in the old days, 
you had, you know, specialists, right, who would yeah. uh, dive deep into languages, histories, and then the people that knew they couldn't jump into that, <laughs> they support, um, you know, by, you know, whatever, providing uh, support monetarily or, or other ways. Sure. And, you know, we have opportunities like that today as well, right? So where we can support artists, historians. 100%, um, yeah. Who may not have the, you know, if you don't have the ability to do it, you know, support those who can do it, right, and put it out. So, um in a short answer, let's say, get yourself uh, some, th there's a good list of books that you could read in English, and I'm working on uh, a book list actually in the summer as uh, some of the coursework I have to do for my PhD is right. create a historical uh, syllabus that deals with Sikh history, right? So in English, uh, I'm getting that together. And uh, so eventually over the summer, you know, that'll be ready. Yeah. Sounds good. And best of wishes to that project, I guess. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it'll take some time. But, um, but yeah, so I'll be putting that out later this summer. We do have some other questions here if you want to jump in. Uh, what is the role of Gudwaras basically supporting art history? Um, um, I've got no support from any Gudwaras um, or <laughs> any institutions. <laughs> Seek institutions such as that only from uh, patrons and buyers who really actually love the work. So uh, the Sikh Gurdwaras are will always be behind. It's it's especially in the UK, for example, they don't uh, support music so much, etc. And you know, giving these ustads some pay. But then again, um, oh, it only says thirty seconds remaining. Do you want to? Shall we quit and start another one? Or uh, I'm. A few more questions. Yeah, for sure. Okay, yeah, we can just start a small one. Just give it a couple of minutes. So uh, you join my one again, yeah? Sounds good. Okay, bye. Yeah, well, uh, yeah. Take a few questions and then kick it. Yeah, so uh, going back to the Gudwara, um, a bit behind the institutions. Like, uh, I'm not impressed so much with Punjab itself in terms of getting rid of old artwork, etc. But that's a whole massive subject on its own. Um, so, yeah, don't expect any support from the Gurdwaras. Unless you have a personal Babaji who just gives you a good tuppy or something. <laughs> that's, that's good enough support. <laughs> yeah, do you think, like, the intro, like, Gurdwaras are run, who, who are they run? Like, they're run by the elder generation, right? Yeah. And um, obviously they don't, I don't know if, the like your demographics of who who are purchasing you know your art or who are interested in like this type of music rag music and stuff like that do you mm -hmm. feel like the younger generation or the old generation i feel like there's a paradox here because a lot yeah. of the massive lot gap of, between young and old yeah but it's weird because the young people yeah. want old stuff like they want the traditional music they want the traditional art they want the traditional history. And then yeah. the older generation is quite comfortable with the status quo. They're like, yo, just, we'll do a, a kanpad every weekend. That's yeah, it. We'll just pay three grand for it. <laughs> yeah. And just turn up at Slokman Lanoa. Right? Yeah. Do you feel like quarantine time is going to change some of this? Because the Gurdwaras ain't going to operate how they are. So. I hope so. Because even looking back at um, the way Gurdwaras were, for example, let's talk about flowers. There's a whole art of flowers that we have uh, have gone missing from our tradition because uh, traditionally they used to take flowers and offer them at the Gudwara in front of the Guru and then use them in Arti. And these were hand-picked lovingly by uh, families. Now we've replaced those flowers with, you know, J-Lo sprays and uh, plastic <laughs> flowers which we put there. So there's a whole art that's died there in terms of nature. And what I'm trying to go to say, whatever you pick or whatever... Thing that speaks to you uh, is, is the de devotion behind it is what's gonna get merit right hmm. so, I forgot I what like... you asked <laughs> yeah I mean I don't know I feel like it's something I've been thinking about for some time which is why I kind of put the podcast in the way I did you know I started it out with you know 
Kanye on the deck, right? Like it's Kanye beat uh, the intro, the outro, same thing as well. Like the the youth want something different, you know what I mean? In but it, which is weird. They still want the old stuff. They want the traditional history. They don't want the dumbed down, the whitewash art, you know, the whitewash oh, history. Comments are so funny. <laughs> Somebody was asking about this sick art fair as well. If you want to answer that, how to make um, you know this art fair? Basically, bigger. you don't limit yourself. Uh, limitations are only going to. Um, you need to if you're talking about art and especially contemporary art, it's it's slightly different. So you have to learn that language also. So you have to go to art fairs. I recommend going to Art Basel, Freeze Art Fair. Um, Freeze New York, etc., because that's where you're going to meet people like-minded. If you are, uh, you know, if you are putting on exhibition, etc. Yeah. Say it with your chest. My art. <laughs> Did you get any other questions you want to talk about? Um, sorry, I have to go through them. Yeah. Uh, okay. Somebody said so. So Jang Nehang said, do you think Renaissance is traditional arts heritage is limited to hotspots like UK or more global phenomenon? Just, yeah, touching on that, because of the amazingness of the internet, we can now connect with uh, people all over the world. So like we are, you know, conversing now, but I'm so actually happy with uh, the youth also in India because they have the similar mentality and similar um, sort of outlook as us as well. There's a few Nihangs that I know who are about my age group in from uh, India, etc. And some other youths who are feeling the same thing. So it's a global thing. There is uh, there is a hot spot. I think a global hot spot, I don't know. But we're working towards that. We're working to um, just inspire and create. That's it. Mm. India Art Fair. India Art Fair was amazing, by the way. I went to India Art Fair in Delhi. I was very impressed with it. I was, I enjoyed it more than Kochi Biennale because um, I got to see some of my most favorite artists at India Art Fair. Okay, you want to answer some stuff? I got, I got a bunch of questions, man, about, um, you know how we started off this talk talking about non thadis and Hangs? So one question that gets got, that gets uh, sent to me a lot because in discussing some of the history, you come across traditions that many people nowadays have never heard about, right? And yeah. in these old texts, you hear them a lot. You know what I mean? Like they're in there a lot, but because of you know modern uh, sensibilities about certain things, including uh, consumption of food and and you know drugs, people. Yeah are uncomfortable with some of these stories, like the stories that relate to how the gurus and how the saints consume sukkah. Now, sukkah is, you know, a drink that, you know, many communities in the uh, Sikh Bans still make. So you have people at Hazur side, you know, this is part of, you know, the the routine that the Gurdwara has, you know, at 2 o'clock in the morning, at 6 o'clock in the morning, you know, in the afternoon, I think 2 2.30 or something, 3 o'clock, they give out the sacrament. Like, this is prashad they give out to the community, you know? And, you know, in the same way, the Hungs serve this in their lungers and in their uh, uh, divans that they hold. So people are wondering, you know, isn't it wrong that, you know, uh, um, you know, six can't consume intoxicants? You know, at the same time, they're okay with, you know, heavy coffees, you know, they'll have all sorts of other type of pill drugs and stuff like that. Um, and I, what I wanted to speak about was how the the notion of what an intoxicant is changes over time. Like, we can see yeah. that right now. Like, and in the UK, is a little bit different. But yeah. right over here in Canada, you know, everything's shut down except for essential services, which is what? Yeah. Like, the cannabis stores are considered essential services over here. So they're, they remain open. You know what I mean? And how quickly um, does that change in a society? Like, I'm, I'm a solicitor. The idea, the idea, yeah. And 
um, like a lawyer. And as you know, you go through law school, you learn about the origin of some of these laws. And it wasn't until the 30s, 40s, or something like that when Canada made sukkah, cannabis, illegal. And why did they make it illegal? Because too many Jamaicans were coming over here and they wanted to prevent Jamaicans from coming over here. They're like these laws. <laughs> Like, like how racist are some of the origins of these laws? It's the same with, um, you know, other types of uh, laws that, uh, you know, the government has passed. Yeah, it's all a power struggle. Right? And, and uh, you, know, you have these traditions, you know, how do you ignore that if they come in, like, all of these historical texts? Do we just say that, you know, modern sensibilities uh, override, you know, our tradition? Yes. And... Like we were talking about how non and hungs are just like, yo, the hell with tea. You know what I mean? Tea is yeah. not for us. And, yeah. you know, everybody knows that caffeine is, is a drug. And while tea may be fine, it's not going to mess you up. But you start taking pills of caffeine, you know, that's a serious <laughs> hospital for that. You know what I mean? Yeah, what yeah, is, yeah. you're going to be messed yeah, up. You, you can legit die off caffeine, right? Yes. And whereas, like, you take a lot of sukha, you take a lot of cannabis, you ain't gonna die. You you might sleep for a while. You might clean out your fridge, but you know, <laughs> get hungry. Yeah. So I mean, these notions about what is acceptable, what is not acceptable, these change over time, which is why looking at historical texts through time is important. That you can then trace. You say, oh, this came up here. Why did this stop over here? And doing that analysis, you can kind of. You shed light on, you know, how traditions come up, how they change, when they stop. Um, so to those who are skeptical about, oh, did the Sikh gurus do this or did the old warriors do that? I would say that suspend modern sensibilities just for a second and look back to the historical text and kind of give them a little bit of deference. Because these people who are writing, they're not... You know, they're not uh, unaware of what it says in Guru Granth Sahib. Like, they have studied, it was their unlike, life. Unlike us, I mean, you know, they used to study. They used to, that was their schooling. Was that yeah. Adam's songs? Their and not life. Only limited, not only limited to Guru Granth Sahib, they also learned the Vedas, Puranas, Shastras, you know, and also Quran, etc. Yeah, because people say like, oh, the Guru Granth Sahib says uh, one should not have cannabis. Like, people... Mention that Kabir line, Kabir Pong, Mashid Pong, that line, right? Yeah. The, to the people that know it, they know it. And if you're going to take one line there so literally to say that, like a lot of times things are used um, as a metaphor, right? Like if you're going to do that, do it across all of Guru Gansha. So what about that line? There's a line, I think it's Freed, who says like, Rukhi Sukhi Kaike Thanda Pani Pio. It says Thanda Pani Pio. So like drink cold water, it's, it's, it's saying live in a life of simplicity, right? It's not, it's not saying, okay, only drink cold water. So what, we're going to remove like Sprite and ginger ale and nobody can drink Fanta anymore. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. So like, if you're going to take that approach, which is an approach, you know, it's a respectful approach. If you're, if it comes from like an, um, like it's, if it's driven by a devotion. It's a devotional, yeah. So yeah, I mean, and crossing that. The bottom line is the bottom line is like, for us, our Guru Granth Sahib is not a rule book. It never has been a rule book. The gurus also had the ability to write rules. They did not. You you won't find. This is how you live. This this this. You will not find. Each Shabbat talks about one thing only, and that's Nam, and um, mm. that's going into devotion and tradition, tradition of devotions and. The main emphasis of almost each Shabbat is is that um, people who take it so literally and try to make a rule book out of that is um, you're just going to fail in terms of you know living life and also you become more negative towards others. It's not about saying this person's right, that person's an idiot. You know you you know you want to get rid of judgments, not you know take more on, which separate you. So, going back to people who treat like rule books, etc. In my experience, it doesn't make you a better person to, you know, look down upon someone else. It's not, it's not something we're used to. Our heroes, you know, living their life like that. They don't. No, absolutely. 
I mean, that's the thing, right? It was like, I don't know if you get this a lot on Instagram. Maybe people send you messages like, oh, how come the painting, you know, things have earrings on them? Or how come they do this? It's like, we've built up a culture where it's just about pointing out what people shouldn't be doing rather than like, you know, digging deeper. To like, what is, what is it representing? What is this? Or, you know, excelling one another. How do you excel at, you know, one another? That's, um, you know, but unfortunately we as human beings come from a culture that, you know, you want to put someone in the ground. So, <laughs> but never let it affect you because somebody just quoted that somebody's uh, in the question, somebody was mentioning that um, they are a queer artist and, you know, they're a bit scared of uh, criticism. So I'd like to say just, you know, with anything, just be yourself, <laughs> your true self. And uh, sure. that's all I could say, actually. Here we go. Uh, somebody was talking about uh, martial arts in the Sikh community, and I'd like to say that somebody talked about Muay Thai and Jiu Jitsu, and I practice both of them. And I'm the only gear study sing there at my club, which has thousands of people. Uh, where are the Sikhs in martial arts? That's what I want to know. Where are you in combat sports? There's not even a handful of us in combat sports. And I'm not talking about Gatka or Shastar Vidya because um, that's, that's a weapon art, etc. But where are we in combat? Uh, please come train with me. <laughs> that's definitely like it, for sure. I think yeah. every single person should learn martial arts. Every single person should learn martial arts. Yeah, and no, I'm right there with you. Man. And that's what you see in the old text, right? Is like a lot of the reasons why you have some of these, you know, these markers and stuff is yeah. like, it's for, what is it for? You know, it represents something, right? And what does it represent? And that representation then, you know, enables a certain mentality, right? And that's why, like, you have that spirit um, amongst, because, like, if you look at history, man, there's a lot of other groups that were, like, writing devotional poetry that had community, even they had, even they had lungers. They had other types of institutions as well, very similar to ours, you know? Yeah. Why, did ours, why did our community, uh, why do we still even have a community? A lot of those communities just dissolve, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, for example, like uh, the Siri Guru Ravidas Gudwara, uh, you know, gets labeled as, oh, another Tamara the Gudwara, Otheni Jana, or oh, Ramgari the Gudwara, Otheni Jana, or Jatanka Gudwara, you know, which um, clearly, clearly is a wrong outlook. We should... Um, what do you call it? We should uh, be proud and also inclusive of everything and just share because it heightens your knowledge, not diminishes your knowledge. You're nah. supposed to learn. Sick means to learn. <laughs> yeah. There's a different mentality back in the day. I think like people, that fluidity within communities allowed people to cross pollinate and take the good from other communities, bring it in and, you know, utilize it. Um, because, you know, we weren't traditionalists in that sense, right? Like, you learn a lot of music. It's not only rag stuff, right? Like, people uh, adapted and changed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Tadi Vara are there as well. You know what I mean? So, where they're singing just random ballads about uh, um, warriors, battle scenes. Uh, so, we have traditions that um, evolved over time as well, right? So, Ravi made a great point. He said, even Bhagat Sen, who is Bani features in Guru Granth Sahib, was a barber by trade, cutting hair. He clearly wasn't written off by the gurus for his trade. Yes, it's all about being inclusive and not exclusive. Yeah. Uh, he asked, Jitinder, what is the meaning and origin of the name Durhali? I've never seen it before. Uh, I don't think most people will see that surname because it's actually Dehele and my grandfather spelled it wrong because he got his mate who, <laughs> who was an Italian working for him in India to spell it. So it was Dehele and it stuck. So BJJ in Muay Thai in Birmingham, lots of love to you guys. Yep. <clears throat> you got some more here? Yeah. Oh, great. So there's a few people doing Shastar Vidya and archery. I mean, amazing traditions. You have to keep up with these traditions. They're, they are so freeing. You'll find yourself, you know, 
able to free yourself within these traditions. So good on you people who are doing something. Yeah, definitely, man. I mean, that's, um, oh, somebody posted 420 tomorrow. That's true. Um, maybe we should tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> One rug it up, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, somebody posted, uh, what are your thoughts on applying what you read in historical text to your own life? Because this was written um, in, you know, the 17th, 18th century. Do you find it crucial to keep up with them? And that ties into what you're talking about martial arts, man, because yeah. it wasn't like you learn a specific martial art because that's a good martial art. It's like you learn martial arts because it creates a mentality, right? Like, you're going to fuck with you, that type of mentality. Um, that even if you are put in a position where, you know what, this is it. Like, this is it. This is the end of my life. That's cool. Like, you go out, you know, in a way that's... Um, congruent with the tradition and the philosophy and the ideology, right, that we have. That's and right. Yeah. When you don't have that, and it's easy not to get into that, when you're living in essential paradise, like, you know, the type of life that we live now, people don't really... Oh, 100% such an such a A-class of lifestyle compared to what we, we know of the past. Yeah, well, so it's an amazing lifestyle. I mean, like, people know... Red old text and see how like brutal life was in the past maybe they would gain that perspective that's another thing that when yeah. people are like what do you get from reading these old texts it's like yo i get the fact that life now is pretty damn awesome like if i wanted to you could go out and eat anything you ever wanted like you know in, in those days you're eating according to season like how many people die a year because okay maybe it doesn't rain this year you know what i mean there's a famine or something like that like life yeah. was brutal right and nowadays because mm -hmm. essentially it's like hey i don't need to know how to the cops are going to come 20 minutes after your cops these are retroactive uh mm. way to solve a problem so i would say that um reading old text gives you context to life okay um Oh, there. Are there any tutorials or guidance in painting miniatures that you can recommend? There seem to be many resources or history. Depending where you are, there are certain schools that uh, you can go to learn uh, this traditional arts. So keep your eye out for them. Um, not many tutorials online. I do not recommend learning... Um, from YouTube, etc. Try and find a teacher. In any that goes to in any sort of art thing, or if you want to learn, you can't just learn a Dilruba. You can't just pick it up and YouTube how to learn a Dilruba. You have to have a right teacher. And also, uh, it same goes with painting or martial arts. You don't just wake up and start smacking a bag, and it doesn't work like that. Learn from champions, my friends. <laughs> sure. Um, do you know any other resources? Somebody said, do you know any other resources where we can refer to when writing poetry, especially traditional? It keeps moving yeah, that's, on. That's a good poetry. question. Sick poetry style. So poetry styles change over time, as in, all right, what are like, uh, this is, could be analogous to nowadays in terms of, you know, what's the, what's the, what's in vogue right now, right? You see like Sidhu, Musiala and these type of people take on like rap, like the way they're, they're singing in Punjabi, but it's essentially rap, right? And you can see how far the genre of rap has gone. Like it started in the, you know, the late eighties and it's become like this thing where, you know, it's a global and other communities now have taken it up. So, you have a similar type of thing and that happening in the 1700s with this language called Braj. Now, Braj Basha comes from, it, it started maybe a couple of centuries before the 1700s, but it was really uh, localized in that area, this area called Braj. And it was used for poetry, for fish. And what happens is it picks up. The ability of its language to incorporate other languages, and to be this very sweet language, the meters of it, people enjoyed to sing along with. 
So it spread, and then it spread so much that you had gurus like Guru Tegh Bahadur, Guru Gobind Singh, who wrote extensively in Braj. So then, because they wrote extensively in Braj, then you have Sikh poetry coming out of the 1700s, like um, Mehma Prakash, I posted a translation of that, uh, 1700s. You have uh, beautiful texts like Sudish Prakash, written by Kavi Santok Singh. These guys are writing in Braj. So in those times, that was the poetry style. And you can learn that. There are um, books that speak about how to write in that manner, how to get the, the meters in a certain way. But that requires you know, extensive knowledge about vocabulary, about grammar of Braj, and then also a meter styles. But those uh, poetry um, books um, that speak about the different meters and how to do it, there's uh, quite a few of them out there. I think Gan Singh Baba has them, has written one. Um, I'm not quite sure who else is. I've seen a few of them out there. So people can learn this. It's a difficult thing to do uh, by yourself. You do need a teacher. Uh, yeah. And that's these type of things. People need to go to India and learn under, under masters. Man. You can't. You can't watch a YouTube video and learn this type of stuff, stuff online. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That goes in, like, if anyone's writing poetry, etc. Because I also I write songs, etc. As well, and obviously inspired by poetry. I mean, that's a good answer, um, Joala. Thank you for sharing that. Basically, um, what else is people saying? <laughs> Hey. Yeah, there's quite a few things. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> cool. What? Is there anything else you need to say, or because I think I'm pretty much answered. I just wanted to share a few things. So when I was talking, I was working for like when we were talking earlier. When I was working for the artist Connor Harrington. Um, which I learned painting. So at that time, he was one of my favorite artists. And then uh, one day I got to the studio and he was like, uh, can I paint you? And I was like, whoa, whoa. <laughs> you know, it's like being asked to, uh, you know, play by your, your favorite musician, play a song with, for example. And then he did a painting of me, which was the cover of one of the Juxtapose magazines. Wicked. And it was uh, me being a matador, basically. Uh, slicing off some devil's head. That's um, awesome. Yeah, so this made it to the cover of Juxtapose, um, uh, like a, what is it called? New Contemporary. So representing C cart, and there's a seat right there. <laughs> so this was made 10 years ago. Cross those boundaries, man, that's it. Yes, that's it. And it's uh, it's been an amazing journey in terms of art. And the most important thing is um, what you do on the daily. Mm. Put in. So if you're practicing music, the if you're passionate about it, you know, try and make efforts and try and be happy every day in terms of your routine, what you're doing what represents you, defines you, or a means of expressing what you need to express. Um, so, yeah. Wicked, man. Um, we had, I'll just take one last question here. Himmet was asking about, um, what do we know about the uh, teaching institutions, like the Bungas that were surrounding Amritsar at the time of Ranjit Singh? Yeah. And we do know a bunch. Um, I was reading a historical book uh, written, I think, 1948, so, or 40, 49, and it was written in Persian, recently translated. It was speaking about the institution surrounding Amritsar. I'll post a photo of that book on my, um, on my Instagram after this. And it was speaking about, okay, who was in charge in Amritsar? Who were the top guys? Really interesting. You know, this is a guy who was just speaking about Punjab on all levels. You know, he was talking about, you know, what was happening in the villages, but then when he came to Amritsar, he was like, all right, top guy in Amritsar, the top guy. There's this guy called Sant Singh. And he is very knowledgeable about Guru Granth Sahib. And who is Sant Singh? Sant Singh happens to be the teacher of Kavi Sant Tok Singh. Kavi Sant Tok Singh spent like 10 years with Sant Singh, digging through um, Guru Granth Sahib, learning Sanskrit, learning Braj poetry. 
You know what I mean? So when people talk about like, oh, this historical text, they say this, they say that, it's against Guru Granth Sahib. It's like, yo, these guys put their life into learning what, uh, um, you know, was in Guru Granth Sahib. And maybe we should take a more humble approach when we, when we look at it to understand that, you know, it's quite possible to have different views of interpretation when looking at the text. And don't assume that you're always right when you look at the text, you know. You're dealing with some giants here who have differed with you potentially, you know. So, yeah. you know, approach it with some humility when you see something that maybe uh, you don't feel is congruent with, with how you um, want to end up here. Unless you got anything else? Uh, somebody says policing artists. Um... I, I usually don't care. I've never cared what anyone thinks anyway. It's your personal journey as long as you're not doing something stupid or, you know, purposely going out of the way to offend someone. Uh, know where you stand as well. Like, don't do something that you know you're going to get shot for. So, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, by all means, express yourself. But it, it's controversy is not always the most interesting thing either. So, there's a lot more other subjects which are way more interesting. Mm. Definitely. Um, what else? I can't see. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. Jawala, it's so good to have time with you today. Um, yeah. Uh, maybe we can do a podcast soon sometime. Yeah, let's do it. I mean, like, that went pretty quick. That was an hour and a half. And, uh, we got through some questions, there's some thoughts. And yeah. uh, I mean, we can, uh, pick up some other time as well. We can maybe do one next month or something. Yeah, for sure. Let's do it. I got a couple more coming up. You're always on this live, man, to, you know, producing music, connecting with other artists. Yeah, um, so I mean, this is kind of my first I, I just love music and I, I'd love to share what, you know, these artists who sit at home on their daily just keep practicing. I love to share their insight and life and because we all grew up together, so it's nice to, to be able to share that. And it's, it's so, I'm humbled that they accept my invitation and also want to perform as well. So that gives me a great joy. Yeah, that's wicked, man. Yeah, this was a lot of fun. Let's do it again. Sometimes. Yeah, definitely. All right, awesome, man. Have a good right. one. Take care and uh, see you guys soon. Thank you all for your questions. And yeah. <clears throat> okay, thank you all. Yo. Yo, uh, take a few questions and then kick it. Yeah, so uh, going back to the Gurdwara, um, a bit behind the institutions, like uh, I'm not impressed so much with Punjab itself in terms of getting rid of old artwork, etc. But that's a whole massive subject on its own. Um, so, yeah, don't expect any support from the Gurdwaras. Unless you have a personal Babaji who just gives you a good tuppy or something. <laughs> that's, that's good enough support. <laughs> yeah, do you think, like, the intro, like, Gurdwaras are run, who, who are they run? Like, they're run by the elder generation, right? Yeah. And um, obviously they don't, I don't know if the, like your demographics of who, who are purchasing, you know, your art or who are interested in like this type of music, rock music and stuff like that. Do you mm -hmm. feel like younger generation or the old generation? I feel like there's a paradox here because a lot yeah. of the- Massive lot gap of, between young and old. Yeah, but it's weird because the young people yeah. want old stuff. Like they want the traditional, music they want the traditional art they want the traditional history and then yeah. the older generation is quite comfortable with the status quo they're like yo just we'll do a, a con part every weekend that's yeah, it we'll just pay three grand for it <laughs> yeah. and just turn up at slokma lanoa right yeah. do you feel like quarantine time is going to change some of this because the gurdwara is ain't going to operate how they are so. i hope so because even looking back at um the way Gurdwaras work. For example, let's talk about flowers. There's a whole art of flowers that we have uh, have gone missing from our tradition because 
uh, traditionally they used to take flowers and offer them at the gudwara in front of the guru and then use them in arti and these were hand picked lovingly by uh, families now we've replaced those flowers with you know j lo sprays and uh, plastic flowers which we put there so there's a whole art that's died there in terms of nature and what i'm trying to go to say it, whatever you pick or whatever thing that speaks to you uh is is the de- devotion behind it is what's going to get merit right hmm so i forgot Still, what you asked <laughs> initially yeah i mean i don't know i feel like it's something i've been thinking about for some time which is why i kind of put the podcast in the way i did you know i started it out with you know Kanye on the deck right like it's Kanye beat uh the intro the outro same thing as well like the the youth want something different you know what i mean in but it, which is weird they still want the old stuff they want the traditional history they don't want to dumb down the whitewash art you know the whitewash so history comment about so funny <laughs> somebody was asking about the stick art fair as well if you want to answer that how to make um you know this art fair basically bigger. you don't limit yourself uh limitations are only going to um you need to if you talking about art and especially contemporary art it's it's slightly different so you have to learn that language also so you have to go to art fairs i recommend going to art basel freeze art fair um freeze new york etc because that's where you're going to meet people like minded if you are uh you know if you are putting on exhibition etc yeah say it with your chest my art <laughs> did you get any other questions you want to talk about um sorry I have to go through them yeah uh, okay somebody said so So Jang Nehang said do you think renaissance is traditional arts heritage is limited to hotspots like UK or more global phenomenon just yeah touching on that because of the amazingness of internet we can now connect with uh, people all over the world so like we and you know conversing now but i'm so actually happy with uh, the youth also in india because they have the similar mentality and similar um sort of outlook as us as well there's a few nihangs that i know who are about my age group in from uh india etc and some other youths who are feeling the same thing so it's a global thing there is uh there is a hot i think a global hot spot i don't know but we're working towards that we're working to um just to inspire and create that's it mm. India art fair India art fair was amazing by the way I went to India art fair in Delhi I was very impressed with it I was I enjoyed it more than Kochi Biennale because um I got to see some of my most favorite artists at India art fair Okay you want to answer some stuff I got I got a bunch of questions man about um you know how we started off this talk talking about non tadis and hangs So one question that gets got that gets uh, sent to me a lot because in discussing some of the history you come across traditions that many people nowadays have never heard about right and mm-hmm. in these old texts you hear them a lot you know what i mean like they're in there a lot but because of you know modern uh sensibilities about certain things including uh consumption of food and and you know drugs people mm-hmm. are uncomfortable with some of these stories like the stories that relate to how the gurus and how the saints consumed sukha now sukha is you know a drink that you know many communities in the uh, sikh bond still make so you have people at hazur sahib you know this is part of you know the the routine that the gurdwara has you know at 2 o'clock in the morning at 6 o'clock in the morning you know in the afternoon i think too 2:30 or something 3 o'clock they give out the sacrament like this is for shad they give out to the community you know and you know in the same way the hungs serve this in their langars and in their um uh divans that they hold 
So people are wondering, you know, isn't it wrong that, you know, um, you know, six can't consume intoxicants, you know, at the same time, they're okay with, you know, heavy coffees, you know, they'll have all sorts of other type of pill drugs and stuff like that. Um, and I, what I wanted to speak about was how the, the notion of what an intoxicant is changes over time. Like we can see yeah. that right now, like and in UK is a little bit different, but yeah. right over here in Canada, you know, everything shut down except for essential services, which is what? Yeah. Like the cannabis stores are considered essential services over here. So they they remain open. You know what I mean? And how quickly um, does that change in a society? Like I'm, I'm a solicitor. The idea, the idea, yeah. And um, like a lawyer. And as you know, you go through law school, you learn about the origin of some of these laws. And it wasn't until the 30s, 40s or something like that when Canada made sukkah cannabis illegal and why did they make it illegal because too many jamaicans were coming over here and they wanted to prevent jamaicans from coming over here they're like these laws <laughs> yeah like like how racist are some of the origins of these laws and same with um you know other types of uh, laws that uh, you know the government has passed yeah it's all a power struggle right and uh you, know, you have these traditions you know, how do you ignore that if they come in like all of these historical texts? Do we just say that, you know, modern sensibilities uh, override, you know, our tradition? Yes. And like we were talking about how Nam Thadis and Hungs are just like, yo, the hell with tea. You know what I mean? Tea is yeah. not for us. And, yeah. you know, everybody knows that caffeine is, is a drug. And while tea may be fine, it's not going to mess you up. But you start taking pills of caffeine, you know, that's a serious <laughs> the hospital for that, you know what I mean? Yeah, what is, yeah you're going to be messed yeah, up. You, you can legit die off caffeine, right? Yes. And whereas, like, you take a lot of sukkah, you take a lot of cannabis, you ain't going to die. You, you might sleep for a while. You might clean out your fridge, but, you know. <laughs> Get hungry. Yeah. So, I mean, these notions about what is acceptable, what is not acceptable, these change over time, which is why looking at historical texts through time is important that you can then trace you say, oh this came up here why did this stop over here and doing that analysis you can kind of you shed light on you know how traditions come up how they change when they stop um so to those who are skeptical about oh did the sick gooders do this or did this old warriors do that i would say that suspend modern sensibilities just for a second and look back to the historical text and kind of give them a little bit of deference because these people who are writing, they're not, you know, they're not uh, unaware of what it says in Guru Granth Sahib. Like they have studied, it was their unlike, life. Unlike us, I mean, you know, they used to study, they used to, that was their schooling, was that yeah. Adam's songs. Their and not life. Only limited, not only limited to Guru Granth Sahib, they also learned the Vedas, Puranas, Shastras, you know, and also Quran, etc. Yeah, because people say like, oh, the Guru Granth Sahib says uh, one should not have cannabis. Like people mention that Kabir line, Kabir Bang, Mashid Bang, that line, right? Yeah. The, to the people that know it, they know it. And if you're going to take one line there so literally to say that, like a lot of times things are used um, as a metaphor, right? Like if you're going to do that, do it across all of Guru Granth Sahib. So what about that line? There's a line, I think it's Freed. Who says like Ruki Suki Kaike Tanda Pani Pio? It says Tanda Pani Pio. So like drink cold water. It's 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 saying live in a life of simplicity, right? It's not it's not saying, okay, only drink cold water. So what we're gonna remove like Sprite and ginger ale and nobody can drink Fanta anymore, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. So like if you're gonna take that approach, which is an approach, you know, it's a respectable approach if you're if it comes from like and um, like it's, if it's driven by a devotion. It's a devotional, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, and crossing that. The bottom line is the bottom line is like for us, our Guru Granth Sahib is not a rule book. It never has been a rule book. The Gurus also had the ability to write rules. They did not. You, you won't find this is how you live, this, this, this. You will not find. Each Shabbat talks about one thing only, and that's Nam. And, um, mm that's going into devotion and tradition, traditional devotions. And the main emphasis of almost each Shabbat is, is that. 
um, people who take it so literally and try to make a rule book out of that is um, you're just going to fail in terms of you know living life and also you become more negative towards others it's not about saying this person's right that person's an idiot you know you you know you want to get rid of judgments not you know take more on which separate you so going back to people who treat like rule books etc in my experience it doesn't make you a better person to you know look down upon someone else it's not it's not something we're used to our heroes you know living their life like that they don't no absolutely i mean that's the thing right it was like i don't know if you get this lot on instagram maybe people send you messages like oh how come the painting you know things have earrings on them or how come they do this and do that it's like we've built up a culture where it's just about pointing out what people shouldn't be doing rather than like you know digging deeper to like what is it representing what is this or you know excelling one another how do you excel at you know one another that's um you know but unfortunately we as human beings come from a culture that you know you want to put someone in the ground so <laughs> but never let it affect you because somebody just quoted that somebody's uh, in the question somebody was mentioning that um they are a queer artist and you know they're a bit scared of uh criticism so i'd like to say just you know with anything just be yourself <laughs> your true self and uh sure. that's all i could say actually with that one uh just somebody for- talking about uh, martial arts in seek community and i'd like to say that somebody just talked about muay thai and jiu jitsu and i practice both of them and i'm the only gay study thing there at my club which has thousands of people uh where are the seeks in martial arts that's what i want to know where are you in combat sports there's not even a handful of us in combat sports and i'm not talking about gatka shastra vidya because um that's that's a weapon art etc but where are we in combat uh please come train with me <laughs> that's definitely like you for sure i think uh, every single person should learn martial arts every single person should learn martial arts yeah and no, i'm right there with you man and that's what you see in the old text right is like a lot of the reasons why you have some of these you know these markers and stuff is yeah. like it's for what is it for you know it represents something right and what does it represent and that representation then you know enables a certain mentality right and that's why like you have that spirit um amongst cuz like if you look at history man there's a lot of other groups that were like writing devotional poetry that had community even they had, even they had longers they had other types of institutions as well very similar to ours you know yeah. why did ours, why did our community uh why do we still even have a community a lot of those communities just dissolve you know what i mean yeah. like for example like uh the sri guru ravidas gurudwara you know gets labeled as oh another tamara da gurudwara othe nahi jana or oh ramgarhia da gurudwara othe nahi jana or jatta ka gurudwara uh you know which um clearly clearly is a wrong outlook we should um what do you call it we should uh, be proud and also inclusive of everything and just share because it heightens your knowledge not diminishes your knowledge nah. supposed to learn sick means to learn <laughs> yeah there's a different mentality back in the day i think like people that fluidity within communities allowed people to cross pollinate and take the good from other communities bring it in you know utilize it um because you know we weren't traditionalists in that sense right like you learn a lot of music it's not only rag stuff right like people uh adapted and changed mm-hmm. and you know tabi bara are there as well you know what i mean so where they're singing just random ballads about uh warriors battle scene uh so we have traditions that um evolved over time as well right so navi made a great point he said even bhagat sen who is bani features in guru granth sahib was a barber by trade cutting hair he clearly wasn't written off by the gurus for his trade Yes, it's all about being inclusive and not exclusive. Yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, so then there what is the meaning and origin of the name Durhali? I've never seen it before. 
Uh, I don't think most people will see that surname because it's actually Dehele and my grandfather spelled it wrong because he got his mate who, <laughs> who was an Italian working for him in India to spell it. So it was Dehele and it stuck. So BJJ in Muay Thai in Birmingham, lots of love to you guys. Yep. <clears throat> you got some more here? Yeah. Oh, great. So there's a few people doing Shastar Vidya and archery. I mean, amazing traditions. You have to keep up with these traditions. They, they are so freeing. You'll find yourself, you know, able to free yourself within these traditions. So good on you people who are doing something. Yeah, definitely, man. I mean, that's, um, oh, somebody posted 420 tomorrow. That's true. Uh, maybe we should <laughs> One rugged up, isn't it? Yeah, for sure. Uh, somebody posted, uh, what are your thoughts on applying what you read in historical thick text to your own life? Because this was written um, in you know, the 17th, 18th century. Do you find it crucial to keep up with them? And that ties into what you're talking about, martial arts, man. Because yeah. it wasn't like you learn a specific martial art because that's a good martial art. It's like you learn martial arts because it creates a mentality right like you're gonna fuck with you that type of mentality um that even if you are put in a position where you know what this is it like this is it this is the end of my life that's cool like you go out you know in a way that's um congruent with the tradition and the philosophy and the ideology right that we have that's and right yeah. when you don't have that and it's easy not to get into that when you're living in essential paradise. Like, you know, the type of life that we live now, people don't really... Oh, 100% such an such a A-class of lifestyle compared to what we, we know of the past. Yeah, it's, a, it's an amazing lifestyle. I mean, like, people don't oh, read old text and see how, like, brutal life was in the past. Maybe they would gain that perspective. That's another thing. That when yeah. people are like, what do you get from reading these old texts? It's like, yo, I get the fact that life now is pretty damn awesome. Like, if I wanted to, you could go out and eat anything you ever wanted. Like, you know, in, in those days, you're eating according to season. Like, how many people die a year because, okay, maybe it doesn't rain this year. You know what I mean? There's a famine or something like that. Like, yeah. life was brutal, right? And nowadays, because yes. we essentially, it's like, hey, I don't need to know how The cops are going to come 20 minutes after you. Cops, these are retroactive. Uh, mm. Way to solve a problem. So I would say that um, reading old text gives you context to life. Okay. Um, sorry. To to oh, there. Are there any tutorials or guidance in painting miniatures that you can recommend? There seem to be many resources or historic. Depending where you are, there are certain schools that uh, you can go to learn uh, this traditional arts. So keep your eye out for them. Um, not many tutorials online. I do not recommend learning um, from YouTube, etc. Try and find a teacher. In any that goes to in any sort of art thing, or if you want to learn, you can't just learn a Dilruba. You can't just pick it up on YouTube how to learn a Dilruba. You have to have a right teacher. And also, uh, it same goes with painting or martial arts. You don't just wake up and start smacking a bag, and it doesn't work like that. Learn from champions, my friends. <laughs> sure. Um. Do you know any other resources? Somebody said, do you know any other resources where we can refer to when writing poetry, especially traditional? It keeps moving yeah, that's, on. That's a poetry. good question. Stick poetry style. So poetry styles change over time, as in, all right, what are like, this is, could be analogous to nowadays in terms of, you know, what's the, what's the, what's in vogue right now, right? You see like Sidhu, Musiala and these type of people take on like rap, like the way they're, they're singing in Punjabi, but it's essentially rap, right? And you can see how far the genre of rap has gone. Like 
it started in the you know the late 80s and it's become like this thing where you know it's a global and other communities now taking it up so you have a similar type of thing and that happening in language with this language called Braj. Now Braj Basha comes from, it, it started maybe a couple of centuries before the 1700s, but it was really uh, localized in that area, this area called Braj. And it was used for poetry, for fish. And what happens is it picks up. The ability of its language to incorporate other languages and to be this very sweet language, the meters of it, people enjoyed to sing along with. So it spread. And then it spread so much that you had gurus like Guru Teg Bahadur, Guru Gobind Singh, who wrote extensively in Braj. So then, because they wrote extensively in Braj, then you have stick poetry coming out of the 1700s, like um, Mehma Prakash. I posted a translation of that uh, in the 1700s. You have uh, beautiful texts like Sudish Prakash, written by Kavi Santok Singh. These guys are writing in Braj. So in those times, that was the poetry style. And you can learn that. There are um, books that speak about how to write in that manner, how to get the, the meters in a certain way. But that requires you know, extensive knowledge about vocabulary, about grammar of Braj, and then also a meter styles. But those uh, poetry um, books um, that speak about the different meters and how to do it, there's uh, quite a few of them out there. Even Khan Singh Baba has them, has written one. Um, I'm not quite sure who else is. I've seen a few of them out there. So people could learn this. It's a difficult thing to do uh, by yourself. You do need a teacher. Uh, yeah. And that's these type of things. People need to go to India and learn under, under masters. Man. You, can't, you can't watch a YouTube video and learn this type of stuff, stuff online. Like, online. Uh, that goes in, like if anyone's writing poetry, etc. Because I also I write songs, etc. as well. And obviously inspired by poetry. I mean, that's a good answer. Um, Joala, thank you for sharing that, basically. Um, what else is people saying? <laughs> okay. Yeah, there's quite a few things. But yeah, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Cool. What? Is there anything else you need to say, or because I think I'm pretty much answered? I just wanted to share a few things. So when I was talking, I was working for like when we were talking earlier. When I was working for the artist Connor Harrington, um, which I learned painting. So at that time, he was one of my favorite artists. And then uh, one day, I got to the studio, and he was like, uh, "Can I paint you?" And I was like, whoa, <laughs> you know, it's like being asked to, uh, you know, play by your, your favorite musician, play a song with, for example. And then he did a painting of me, which was the cover of one of the Juxtapose magazines. Oh, wicked. And it was uh, me being a matador, basically, uh, slicing off some devil's head. That's um, awesome. Yeah, so this made it to the cover of Juxtapose um uh, like a, what is it called? New Contemporary. So representing C cart, and there's a seat right there. <laughs> so this was maybe 10 years ago. Cross those boundaries, man, that's it. Yes, that's it. And it's uh, it's been an amazing journey in terms of art. And the most important thing is um, what you do on the daily. Mm. Put in. So if you're practicing music, the Lurubai, if you're passionate about it, you know, try and make efforts and try and be happy every day in terms of your routine, what you're doing, what represents you, defines you, or a means of expressing what you need to express. Um, so, yeah. Wicked, man. Um, we had, I'll just take one last question here. Himmet was asking about um, what do we know about the uh, teaching institutions like the Bungas that were surrounding Amritsar at the time of Ranjit Singh. Yeah. And we do know a bunch. Um, I was reading a historical book uh, written, I think, 1948 so, or 40, 49. And it was written in Persian, recently translated. It was speaking about the institutions surrounding Amritsar 
I'll post a photo of that book on my um, on my Instagram after this. And it was speaking about, okay, who was in charge in Amritsar? Who were the top guys? Really interesting. You know, this is a guy who was just speaking about Punjab on all levels. You know, he was talking about, you know, what was happening in the villages. But then when he came to Amritsar, he was like, all right, top guy in Amritsar? The top guy. There's this guy called Sant Singh. And he is very knowledgeable about Guru Granth Sahib. And who is Sant Singh? Sant Singh happens to be the teacher of Kavi Santok Singh. Kavi Santok Singh spent like 10 years with Sant Singh digging through um, Guru Granth Sahib, learning Sanskrit, learning Braj poetry. You know what I mean? So when people talk about like, oh, this historical text, they say this, they say that, it's against Guru Granth Sahib. It's like, yo, these guys put their life into learning what, um, you know, was in Guru Granth Sahib. And maybe we should take a more humble approach when we, when we look at it to understand that, you know, it's quite possible to have different views of interpretation when looking at the text. And don't assume that you're always right when you look at the text, you know. You're dealing with some giants here who have differed with you potentially, you know. So, yeah. you know, approach it with some humility when you see something that maybe uh, you don't feel is congruent with, with how you think. Um,